1991 onwards, we have a different kind of relationship. The scholars will focus on these, all these issues in later on, but uh, before uh, speaking much, I would uh, invite Professor Dr. Lama to deliver the keynote speech. Professor Lama. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Professor Uttal um, Roy, uh, Professor Chandan Roy, Madam Sukla, Sukla Ghosh, uh, Professor Manas Paldia, and uh, Professor uh, Mr. Ajay Kumar Dutt for inviting me. And also, uh, today is the Chairman Professor Rup Kumar Bowman for chairing this session. Well, uh, uh, I am very Delighted that uh, uh, two colleges, uh, Kudiram, uh, Said Kudiram Bos uh, College and uh, Malda College, came together to organize this webinar. Uh, quite a few webinars are taking place all across, and uh, I'm a little tired of participating in webinar because uh, there are too many webinars. So I have said. Uh, I started saying no to webinars. Uh, neither you can meet people, nor have a cup of tea together, right? So it's a very dry uh, interaction sometimes. But uh, this is the first uh, interaction. But it's very interesting to note that uh, college uh, in Alipur, Duar, and Malta would come together. So I was very enthused by the very initiative taken by both uh, Dr. Roy and Dr. Chandan Roy, Paul Roy and Chandan Roy, to take this um, you know, webinar on uh, India, China, a very, very interesting topic also, and very, very, uh, what you call it, uh, historically significant topic also. And it's going to be a major issue in the global politics also. Uh -huh. I would like to uh, speak on quite a few things uh, because uh, I've been studying China from a slightly different perspective than what many scholars do. I did uh, teach in China for almost two years and uh, uh, learned what is, uh, what is uh, generally not uh, discussed uh, in India. So I'm going to tell certain things uh, which uh, we do not uh, really find uh, in the in the India China discourse uh, in in India China discourse in uh, in India, you know after the 1954 agreement uh, we signed uh, that is uh, between India and China on third intercourse between that region of China and India. This was a very historic agreement because this was the first agreement which brought the Panchila between India and uh, China, uh, right? And uh, this was um, and one of the very one of the very key features in the uh, in the, the Panchila is uh, number two uh, um, Shila, that is um, uh, mutual non-agression. That means there will be no aggression uh, and no inter third was no mutual what you call it no uh, interference. But the 1962 war happened, and we have a large number of literature today to discuss about what really happened and why 1962 conflict between India and China happened. And one of the major findings uh, of uh, scholars, policymakers, uh, is the fact that uh, it happened uh, despite uh, such a close. Uh, Interactions between uh, our Prime Minister Tarun Lai and from the Chinese, uh, our Prime Minister uh, Pandit Nehru, and from the Chinese side, uh, the 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 Chow uh, Lai, a series of meetings. And uh, in you know, I was reading some of the uh, confabulations in this meeting in some of the uh, so some of the not very public documents. Uh, between India and China, and if I found that uh, 
throughout the discourse before 1962, India emphasized the fact that, look, we have all the proof of the, the borders because borders were between India and China were never demarcated as a geometric line. So there was some kind of confusion between what is India's and what is China. But during that time, India showed all the proof. India had legal proof. India had constitutional proof. India had historical proof. India had proof related to human settlements in the borders. India had proof related to what you call it, national boundaries. And uh, they started exchanging these notes on that. And uh, you'll be surprised that when the final uh, documents were exchanged, uh, we realized that uh, uh, Chinese did not have uh, uh, a very concrete proof like what we have in India. And that continues uh, the, to be the case here today. Say, for example, in the Western, Eastern, and the Middle sector, right, uh, India produced legal basis to the extent of 114 evidences, whereas Chinese came with only 47 evidences that to India could trust very, very easily. Then you have the traditional basis and administrative basis, where it, they were very, very, uh, very, very, what you call it, uh, distinctly demarcated. India produced about 159 evidences and Chinese produced about 66. And when Indian government, led by Pandit Nehru, uh, asked the Chinese government, look, oh, you give us uh, the evidences the way we have given. We gave, as I, as I said, we gave several evidences in the line of legal, um, uh, you know, documents on the basis of uh, settlements in the borders, on the basis of what we call it, uh, the, the national boundaries, all kinds of documents, so they did not have. So finally the war took place and uh, one of the uh, very serious fallouts were of the war was was the boundary still remained or uh, what you call undemarcated right and that was that is what really uh, has been that is what has been bothering us for the last many many years and this time also uh, this has really come up in a big way so but this is this happens despite the fact that india in the in the in the, in the, in the in the range of discourses with China and its special emissaries, emissaries on borders have asked uh, the Chinese to exchange the map. And that is the least thing they would do because they would not like to exchange the map. The, the moment the maps are exchanged, many things will come up and those definitely would not be in favor of China. But in the 19, after the 1962 war, uh, we generally uh, started doing our own business in the country. Ran the country, we had uh, uh, several prospective projects in the country, we had several problems in the country, but Chinese would not give up their uh, designs uh, in, the, in, in, the, uh, in, in, in disturbing or dislocating uh, our country. So, for example, uh, in the entire in the entire discourse between India and China of 1960s, one of our major findings was China does not do what it says, and uh, it does what it does not say. Right, that means there's a tremendous degree of uh, duplicity, there is a tremendous degree of ambiguity, and there is a very tremendous degree of uh, running two parallel ways. And you can see that uh, this time also they repeated exactly this, despite our Prime Minister Narendra Modi's such friendly relations with the Chinese President, and also referring to both Wuhan, 
Spirit and uh, Chennai uh, Connect in 2018 and 2019. So given this background, uh, let me tell you, China did not give up uh, what you call it, it's uh, uh, implementing its uh, deleterious intentions uh, in India. For example, after 1947, when there was East Pakistan, uh, it ganged up with East Pakistan to really try to dislocate and to a certain extent even dismember some of the northeast regions of the country. You will see examples of Mizoram, Manipur, Nagaland and the insurgents. So large number of these insurgents with the help of East Pakistan were taken to Pakistan, uh, taken to Pakistan and China, train brought them back. So there's a very beautiful of account of what really happened in these years. You can read uh, books by um, by 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 uh, Ian Ram who was the BSF uh, director general, and you can even read uh, very interesting um, other books uh, published in the. Uh, northeast and near our home in Alipurduar or in Darjeeling, you will see how the Naxalite movement led by um, uh, Kanu Sanyalji and uh, Charu Madunjaji were exploited by China uh, to really, uh, to really, uh, you know, bring a kind of a very diabolic. Uh, disturbance in the chicken neck area, right? We stand, the entire Darjeeling district, including Siliguri, stand at a very, very critical corridor, we call it chicken neck, that really connects the entire northeast with, the northeast region with the rest of India. And if you read uh, some of, now the, now the, now many things are coming out. One of the things which I came out, I read a very beautiful book by Mr. Bapa Ditya Paul on uh, uh, Kanu Sanyalji, the first Naxal, right? And it books, this book very clearly mentions about how Kanu Sanyalji and his uh, team went all the way to China via Nepal, then crossed over to Tibet, then they were flown to Beijing where they met Mao Zedong, Chao Enlai, discussed with them about what to do. And one of the recent reports which came out from China, now it's coming out, it says that in one of the meetings, Chao Enlai did tell the, the communists, the, 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 what you call the Naxal leaders, that look, if you are able to make uh, that particular region another district of uh, China, can you imagine, of China, then we will have... Uh, uh, then you can succeed in the national forum as a kind of a, as a kind of a left uh, force to rule the nation. And it's very clearly written, and many uh, many issues have come up uh, in this. Then you will find uh, uh, when Sikkim merged into India in 1975, Chinese would never recognize it, and Chinese uh, would put it uh, alongside Bhutan and Nepal. Uh, and say that this is also a kind of independent nation. Well, it did not matter to us because uh, Sikkim has been tightly integrated with it. But it is a little embarrassing that when you go to China, uh, taught uh, uh, a literature where Sikkim is kept out of uh, of, of of India. Uh, but that was a little embarrassing. But it it really did not matter. But in 2003, when our Prime Minister Atal Bihari Bajpayee Ji went there in China and signed the agreement to reopen the Nathula trade route, we were very clear. At that time, I was Chief Economic Advisor in the government of Sikkim, and we were very keen that this route uh, should be open. And uh, the route was opened in 2006, uh, July. I remember the date, 6th July 2006. And... Uh, and uh, after 44 years, right, uh, and that route used to be, along with Nathula and Jalepla, used to be one of the most thriving trade centers uh, for Bengal, uh, for Darjeeling and uh, 
Kalimpong areas. Many traders used to come from all over the world, including from Japan, US, uh, UK, many places. And we used to send all kinds of uh, goods, including fountain pens and the parts of the cars and all. And from China, uh, from Tibet, uh, we generally brought what you call it uh, uh, the, the wool, right? And we used to export from Siliguri and uh, and uh, in 2006, we will see China would remove this particular uh, uh, patch of land from as an independent country and put it back into Indian maps. So that was a major, major, what you call it, uh, major, major uh, deviation or, or in, the, in, the, in the Chinese policy. Uh, but you will find, then, then suddenly in 19... 88, 89, you will find India-China relations improving uh, slightly. After our Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhiji visited China, started uh, and confabulated with uh, uh, with uh, the Chinese uh, President Chavez, uh, the Deng Xiaoping, uh, many things had changed in China by then. then. Then they started interacting. And after that, we signed a series of uh, what you call far-reaching agreements. I remember five major agreements. One was maintenance of peace and tranquility along the line of actual control in 1993. The second was confidence building majors in the military field along the LHC in 1996. The protocol on modalities for the implementations of CBM in 2005 and working mechanism for consultation and coordination on India-China border affairs in 2012 and border defense cooperation agreement in 2013. And these were very, very progressive agreements. I must tell you, our uh, uh, national security advisor, the then um, uh, Ambassador Siv Sankar Menon, in his book, uh, the choices inside the making of India's foreign policy eloquently discusses all these issues. These arguments were very historic, uh, precisely because, uh, uh, precisely because, uh, these agreements, to a large extent, uh, what you call it, uh, to a large extent, delinked the border issues with other issues of relationship, say for example, trade, uh, culture, uh, climate change, investment, all kinds of relations were slightly delinked from the border. That means we would go on negotiating issues related to borders, but we will not may take uh, our misunderstanding and disputes about borders to really prevent us from moving uh, 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 in a major way in other areas of cooperation. That's why many, many things happen. And uh, you will also be very interesting to note that in the 2013 agreement, uh, we discussed so many issues. How to maintain border. If there is some kind of a dispute in the borders, how do you contact each other, right? And uh, what are the categories of armaments which we cannot use in the borders, right? And we also said that uh, other issues in the borders, like smuggling of arms, wildlife articles and contrabands, natural disasters, or even infectious diseases, right? In what way we would collaborate on this? So it was very, very fascinating to see that China and India were working together. And you'll find we started working together on many, many critical issues. For example, trade, investment, tourism, professional exchanges. We started participating in BRICS, right? The BCIM, uh, the SCO, the Bright Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, we started participating in even in AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Banks and the new development banks. So it was a very, very comprehensive relation. So you will find in 1990, our trade with China 
was only 49 million, right? That means 4.9 crore dollar. Whereas uh, today you will find about uh, 90 billion of trade between uh, India and uh, India and China. So it was a very, very kind of an expansive, comprehensive relationship. And we had two very significant meetings after the Dokkan happened, uh, that is between Indian Prime Minister, uh, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji and uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping um, uh, in Wuhan uh, and in uh, China. Very, very friendly meetings, very, very heartwarming meetings. Suddenly you will find drastic change in the Chinese attitude. Right, and when it when the corona virus is started is spreading from China, uh, one of the things uh, we all expected from a very friendly country in China was to give us information about scientific, technical, professional information about what is this virus all about, how to really combat this virus. Uh, what are the kinds of indicators, how does it spread and all, right? And uh, you'll be surprised, China would not send us uh, any of these details. Whatever details we will get about these viruses would come all the way from Japan, from UK, from South Korea, and from US, right? And China would not give us anything exactly on these lines, whatever is available. So that was a major blow to our relationship and on top of that uh, what we saw in the last four months we saw that Chinese gradually intruded into some of the uh, some of the Indian territories and what happened we all know so very well right so this again showed uh, this also uh, this again reconfirmed the fact that uh, that uh, uh, what it did in 1960s, ultimately leading to the 1962 war, uh, that is a kind of a duplicate policy, a kind of an ambiguity, a kind, kind of what it says and doesn't do policy, again repeated in the, we could see that very, very blatantly repeated in the last uh, three, four months between India and China. So that has been the story. I tell you, there's been a tremendous pressure on China. In the last uh, uh, two years, three years, and uh, China would not like many things which India does it because of its strong national interest. Uh, alignment with a country like Japan, uh, Australia, uh, a country like even Vietnam, or countries around South China Xi, or even countries like even, or even US, China would never like to see, precisely because uh, China thinks that if we align with these countries on issues of uh, military understanding, then uh, China would be largely uh, sidelined in case of strategic issues, economic issues. But three, four things are happening in China today. One, of course, is we can see a kind of a, uh, some kind of a domestic uh, turbulence in China, right? Despite the fact that China has done exceedingly brilliant work as far as development is concerned. But uh, there is no gainsaying the fact that China has done exceedingly. Some of us who have visited China, seen the villages in China, the way they have given basic needs to the people, the way they have eradicated poverty, they have given, the way they have set up infrastructures, the, the way they have set up facilities, basic amenities for people at large is absolutely amazing. And uh, India has a lot of things to learn from China on this perspective. You know, China has suffered a very dangerous famine before 1962 killed millions of people and another another bout of uh, 
problems between 1966 to 1976 uh, in the name of cultural revolution led by um, uh, Mao Zedong, right? And that devastated China. And how it uh, over, overcame this kind of devastation is absolutely a brilliant uh, narration to study also, to grasp also, and to a large extent to learn also. Because uh, what China was in, uh, uh, was in the late 1970s was absolutely devastating. Many people thought that this country will be broken into pieces. But in 1979, when Deng Xiaoping came and he started uh, uh, quite a few things, including economic reforms, um, and uh, policies which he said, Jobi and Zinze, that means a good regional policy as a regional power. And also, it did say that, look, um, it does not really matter when the, whether the cat is a black or a white cat. Uh, uh, the color of the cat is black or white. As long as it catches uh, mice or mouse, uh, this is good enough. Uh, that's, what, uh, that's how they develop. And uh, when you visit uh, the uh, countries, uh, countryside in China, uh, amazing the way they developed, right? Uh, the way uh, they, they have uh, brought infrastructure. And I would say much better than even uh, Japan uh, and US. So that is one part of the story. The other part of the story is, of course, uh, the, the, these political suppressions, issues of human rights, issues of uh, basic rights, such kind of things. And in case of, uh, uh, in case of today, China, you have serious, three serious problems. One is, uh, uh, you have problems related to domestic politics, because for the first time, uh, you will have a president uh, in China who will have uh, no term, you know, there is no what you call limit to his term. There is no chance of the president uh, getting retired in the course of the next five, ten years. So this is something like what uh, what uh, Chairman Mao Zedong uh, did. So this is something. So there is, uh, of course, some kind of a resistance among the political uh, parties here. The second interesting thing about this. Uh, the second interesting thing about uh, China today is there is some kind of a uh, withdrawal tendency. Japanese, who used to be one of the top investors uh, in China, they are withdrawing. Can you imagine? After the after the U.S. put uh, kind of a um, tariff barriers on the Chinese exports, right and Decoupled its relationship with China, or oh, there has been closing down a large number of, uh, of, China, of uh, U.S. oriented uh, export based, including that of Apple, uh, Dell, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, right, um, Lenovo, Acer, and all are closing down their shops uh, in China, thereby disrupting Chinese supply chain across the world. It used to be one of the most one of the most fascinating supply chains. That means nobody could do anything without Chinese interventions. You could see that in a large section of uh, East Asia, um, America, right? And at the same time, you will find Japanese are withdrawing. In fact, you will be surprised. Japanese government has told its companies that uh, uh, we will earmark two billion dollars to the Japanese companies relief that where whichever Japanese companies would like to come back to China, sorry, come back to Japan, we will spend two billion dollars on them. And all what we get today in India, your your Sony television, or uh, to any of the Japanese companies, Panasonic to anything which is actually assembled in China in the name of uh, small and medium enterprises they get because the Chinese labor used to be cheap, right? And so now China, the, 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 the Japanese are closing down 
and Japanese are taking all these companies to Southeast Asian countries, including uh, Vietnam and Thailand. And this is a major opportunity for us in India, in Bengal, in south, in eastern part of India, um, and in northeast part of India to bring some of these uh, Japanese investors who are living uh, China in a big way, right? And Japanese did it because of number of things. It never liked uh, Chinese intervention in Senkiku Islands in the East China Sea. Um, then it ne never liked what Chinese did in South China Sea, right? But uh, more than that, right? Japanese uh, thought now thinks that it is uh, the relationship between China and uh, Japan would be unsustainable. So you will find many things happening within China. So, so there is a possibility that there will be some kind of a huge economic uh, dislocations in China, bringing about some kind of instability in some sections of China. So, but at the same time, let me tell you, uh, when you talk about this region in India, uh, this South Asia, our countries in South Asia, China has adopted Trishul approach. I call it Trishul because it is a trident approach. How China entered into India, how China entered into Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, it has a Trishul approach to Pakistan also. In this Trishul approach, China has used three uh, um, uh, the trident instruments one, of course, is a local instrument. The second is the national instrument. And third is a regional instrument. You'll find, for example, it's a very, very well-designed Chinese plan to enter into India, Nepal, Pakistan, Bangladesh in a kind of a very, very local way. For example, it used Kunjara Pass in Karakoram Highway to enter into China, to Pakistan. It used Tatopani and Kerong to use to enter into Nepal. Very, very local uh, passes. It used what you call Wakhan Corridor in Afghanistan to enter into Afghanistan. It used Nathula Shukkila in Himachal Pradesh and Lipulek in Uttarakhand to enter into India. So therefore, it has used this local ways. That's what it has done in Myanmar. It has done in Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, and to a large extent, even Central Asian countries like Kyrgyzstan and all these countries. So what is the idea of this local integration? idea is to really in, go into these countries locally, engage them locally, and after engaging them locally, open that area into much, much larger Chinese uh, projects like Belt and Road Initiatives, Chinese projects like, say, for example, go to Sikkim and to Nathula, right? You'll be surprised. Uh, China brought a uh, railway line to Tibet, 18,000 uh, 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 altitude. You know, to, to when you ride this, in this train, you will have to use oxygen. How they brought all the way from Shanghai to Lhasa, and how they extended it to Sigatse, and how they from Sigatse they are taking to Nepal border, how they are taking bringing this railway board, railway line to Yatung uh, in uh, on the other side of Natura. Very very interesting to see that, and these railway lines are all linked to Middle Eastern China. So. For example, you will see between between uh, uh, between uh, China and uh, Pakistan, the Kunjara Pass is uh, what what they are doing is the Karakoram Highway in the Kunjara Pass is a critical point for China's China Pakistan economic corridor, and they already have a trade of almost one billion dollar, right? Uh, through this pass. Can you imagine? Right? With uh, Myanmar, you have the Muse Ruili border between Kunming, uh, between Yunnan province of China and uh, and the Myanmar's border. And you will be surprised, 
the trade between uh, Myanmar and China through border is six billion dollar. Can you imagine? So it's a very very interesting game. And now Chinese are saying that in the six billion dollar trade, we should use um, uh, the Chinese yuan, the RMB, NMB, right, and not uh, the US dollars or any other currencies. And they are saying absolutely similar thing possibly to uh, Nepal also. Therefore, a very, very interesting situation there. Then you have a national engagement. You move from local then to national engagement. And when we move to national engagement, you will find, oh, massive increase in trade investment between India, between China and Bangladesh, between China and Sri Lanka, China and Maldives, Afghanistan with India, right? You will be surprised. Entire South Asia's trade with China, that means eight countries in South Asia, used to have a trade with China to the extent of 1.18 billion in 1990. And uh, it increased to 127.36 billion in 2018. Can you imagine? Right? China, which is absolutely and relatively a new player here in South Asia, uh, today India's 15% of its imports is from China. Can you imagine? So we are dependent to the extent of 15% to in a single country. Pakistan, 20% dependence. Sri Lanka, 19% dependence. Bangladesh, which has no physical connection with China, depends on China to the extent of 23% of its import. And if you see the investment, Hamam Tota, the Colombo port city in Sri Lanka to Para Power Project to Dhaka Chittagong railway line in Bangladesh to China Pakistan Economic Corridor. These are what you call the national uh, engagement of China. That is what you call the three in the, in the, in the Trishul approach. The third approach in the Trishul politics is what you call the regional approach. So you are not satisfied with the local. You are also not satisfied with the national. But now you would like to engage the countries in South Asia at a regional level, at SARC level, ASEAN level, uh, get it, the BRIM, the, the BIMSTEC level, the what you call the BCIM level, the BBI, and all kinds of engagements you would like to know. Right? So... China would like to be a member of this, but I tell you, given what China has done in South Asia, even if it is not given a formal membership of China, China is always a de facto member of SAR because it is such a significant player in South Asia. As a result of which, it is a balancing game today. On the one hand, Bangladesh and India have such a prolific historical relationship Right? China and Sri Lanka, or India and Sri Lanka, India and Nepal, India and Bhutan have such significant relationship. Right? On the other hand, Chinese are going to these countries in a big way. So the Chinese, the Bangladeshi government, Sri Lankan government, Nepalese government are trying to balance. How do you balance India and China? Because China has become such a powerful uh, entry, uh, int okay, what, entry point in case of South Asia. So how do you balance? You will see the uh, Sri Lankan Prime Minister when he was President Rajapaksa, Mahinda Rajapaksa, he started allying with China, then he found it is so very difficult because uh, India has been a traditional partner. You will find today in Nepal also the happening, many things happening, in Bangladesh also. So it is a very, very difficult balancing game for these many countries in South Asia about how to balance between India and China, which never used to be the case. 20 years back, India used to be the predominant uh, development partner in these countries. So in this respect, you know, one of the things which I uh, noticed was, look at Bangladesh. When uh, President Xi Jinping visited Bangladesh in 2016 and gave uh, a huge... Uh, uh, you know, dole out to Bangladesh, varying from possibly 22 billion to 
I don't know how many dollars it came, billion dollars it came to. And at that point of time, I was looking through what would be the reaction of the Bangladeshi Prime Minister. Because he has such a close relationship with India. We have a, a free trade regime. We have, a, what you call it, uh, uh, we have a, a very good relationship in Bangladesh from their freedom struggle, right, to, 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 uh, to some kind of, we have a free electricity flow between, between India and uh, Bangladesh. So many things. And I was watching how will it, uh, how will Bangladeshi Prime Minister react to uh, the Bangladesh, the Chinese president going there and announcing such a big uh, loan. Is that fine now? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah? Now, Professor Brahma, somehow uh, your microphone has been muted. Please unmute. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm not doing it. Okay. Is that fine? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, now, sir. see. What, Chinese, what Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina said uh, is something very typical about how our neighboring countries are trying to balance between India and China. He said after the visit of the President Xi Jinping uh, in, in China, he said, I quote, good relations with everyone. Bangladesh would maintain good relations with everyone. The purchasing power of our people will increase. And who will be the biggest beneficiary of that in our region? And she answers also saying that India. India is best poised to benefit from the Bangladesh market. This is how she balances it. Very, very interesting. Therefore, it's a very, very crucial situation in South Asia. So I will end by uh, mentioning uh, Another aspect of India-China relationship today. You know, we only talk about our relationship on the hard issues. Issues related to uh, military arsenals, issues related to about border. But the Chinese, uh, right, the, the Chinese have a very definite policy in South Asia on the soft issues. So, for example, issues related to natural resources, how to really, really harness, exploit natural resources of South Asian countries. Entire Himalayan belt, how do we really bring, control this Himalayan belt? Because for us in India, um, the, 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 as far as our national security perimeters are concerned, Himalayas are the borders. The 1950 treaty between India and Nepal and the 2007 or 1949 treaty between India and Bangladesh, Bhutan would very clearly mention about this. That's why we have an open border between India and Nepal and India and Bhutan. And uh, you have genetic resources. Most of our genetic resources are being smuggled to China in the name of what you call it genetic piracy and research, wildlife, large number. If you see what happened in the Wuhan wildlife market, the weight market, you'll be signed, you'll be fine, you'll find most of the wildlife there, including our pangolin, including many of our wildlife were smuggled to China, right, to, through the Himalayan routes only. But the biggest danger today for us from the other side of the border is on water. You'd be surprised we get both Indus and both uh, and Brahmaputra from China. And what is happening inside China as far as water is concerned is something very, very disturbing. Right? Many of the rivers 
including the very famous Yellow River, dried up in China. They used water in such an intensive manner that many of these rivers dried up in China. And uh, so you will find when you read book by Ma Jun, uh, that is uh, China's Water Crisis, and Andrew Murtha's book on China, Water Warriors, you will find the real stories about what is happening in China as far as water is concerned. And if the water sources dried up in China, if the glacial mills happen rapidly in China, uh, we are bound to suffer because both uh, Yalong Shangto or Brahmaputra or Indus would actually come from, would have their origin in, 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 uh, in, the, in the Tibet, uh, what you call it, water towers, right? And if you see what has happened, the very recent report by Deborah Tan, Hoover Thiriot and Don Magrar on China water risk very clearly says that there are 11 dry provinces in China. And these 11 dry provinces are basically in the, in the northeast, right, and, uh, and, and the east, including Shanghai, Beijing, uh, Tianjin, Jiangsu, and all these provinces. And you will be surprised, these 11 dry provinces contribute all, more than 50% of Chinese gross domestic product, GDP. So you can import. But there's no water. What will you do? So what they're doing is they are now diverting water from Yangtze River, right? And they have decided there will be three causes of diversion. One is the eastern diversion, western diversion, and the central diversion. That diversion means what? They will take they will take water from south to north. That means water will have unnatural flows. It will flow upwards. Can you imagine? Water will flow upwards, right? So they have now they have now more or less completed what you call the Eastern Canal, almost fourteen hundred kilometers of green water channel they have made, and the water. Yangtze goes upwards to Beijing, to Tianjin, to Shanghai, to Jiangsu, right, covering billion, millions and millions of people there, of irrigating their land. So this is a scale. That means this is something anti-nature. More seriously, what they are doing, when they are not able to divert water uh, from the Himalayan regions, that is Tibet, Sichuan, Shanghai, Right, all these provinces, what they are doing is now they are playing with the atmospheric layers. In the atmosphere, you have all kinds of layers, you know, a stratosphere to 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 troposphere to ozone layer, and you have a what you call it atmospheric layer that bears uh, or the rain rain clouds, uh, maybe what you call it zero cumulus cumulus or cumulus clouds. So they are, they, they are making hole in this atmospheric layers wherever they want water and they call this particular technology known as Tihanin technology. I was, I was reading some of the scientific literature on Tihanin technology. You will be surprised it is absolutely anti-natural. So last year when I happened to visit, uh, what do you call it, um, Kailas Mansarava, the famous uh, pilgrimage places. Uh, we drove down from Lhasa to Gansi to Sigatse to Saga and to Thache village. Then uh, we had a dozen of um, what what they call it Kang Rinpoche or what is Kailas mountain and uh, and the and Mansarovar lake. And then further to Norway. And on the way, uh, I could see both the origin of. Uh, and the and the and the Indus River goes to India, then to Pakistan. Brahmaputra comes to India, then to Bangladesh. Right now, you will be surprised. A number of tributaries of these uh, two magni uh, magnificent rivers had already dried up in the month of June. Right, and uh, that is an indication that what would be the shape of Brahmaputra. And Indus, and more than that, uh, Chinese have started building 
huge dams on Brahmaputra. That means they are already into what you call water, water diversions uh, from these rivers. Therefore, what it tells us is we really have to uh, strengthen our hydro diplomacy. Information on hydro resources, right? Uh, on, uh, on technicalities of understanding how rivers are, are diverted, right? In India, we have a river diversion process for the last 20 years, but it has not taken up. But they decided to divert Yangja River in 2014, and by 2018, they are diverted to the extent of almost 1,400 kilometers. So that is how they moved solidly in a very, very fast manner. And there are no resistance to all these, unlike in our country. Right? Therefore, we need to really strengthen uh, our information base about an intelligence system, about a negotiating skills and knowledge base on China in a very, very big manner and in a very, very comprehensive manner. How Pangolin, right? In Darjeeling, we call it, uh, uh, we call it salak, and eating animals, right? Actually, actually, the one, one of the scientific reports says that it was from Pangolin, which, uh, the, from Pangolin, which transmuted into uh, coronavirus and got transmitted into human beings, right? So it was, the, and pangolin is a very native element, animal of Darjeeling, right? And you'll be surprised how pangolin of Darjeeling would make its way all the way to Wuhan. Who are the people involved, right? Who are the agencies involved? There must be some agencies on the Indian side, right? How rhinoceros, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, the, the bones, right, horns would get exported to uh, China, which is available there. How, what you call it, in, in the mountains, we call it Yarsa Kumpa, that is the caterpillar fingers, which is used by all the Olympic peers in China uh, as what you call it, they call it uh, Chinese uh, Viagra, that would enhance their vitality. How that goes, gets into uh, China without the support of some of their uh, some of their counterparts uh, in in India. Therefore, we need to besides the LAC issues, border issues, trade issues for us living in the border areas like you uh, and us uh, in 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 the in the in the eastern part of India. We must really start doing research in the universities and in the colleges on this kind of issues. How we are affected. Not only by the Chinese, but other by other other foreign elements, uh, so that our national security, our national interest, our interest of provincial governments are kept intact. So, therefore, I uh, would like to end my conversation here. I would like to very profusely thank all the organizers, uh, Professor Roy, both Professor Uttal Roy and Professor Chandan Roy, and also would like to thank. All, all of you, very distinguished participants from across uh, Bengal, uh, and also, and of course, Dr. Rupna and Berman, the chairman of this session. Thank you very much. Namaste. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Lama, for your excellent speech. Uh, you really, you have enlightened us with different aspects of India-China relations. Uh, particularly from 1950 onwards, you have discussed in details how. India and China were engaged in the 1950s and what was the background of the first Indo-China war in 1960s and uh, we have learned a lot of you from uh, you with certain new information how India and China tried to show their uh, claim to other, each other. In 1967 uh, you have also discussed how the uh, emergence of East Pakistan and its involvement with China, it uh, encouraged the uh, Northeast Indian insurgent groups in the 1960 onwards with certain rights. And also you have uh, discussed how the Naxalite movement of 1960s, particularly in 1967, the Naxalites of Naxalwadi, they were engaged with China 
and here I would like to share all, uh, my personal experience in 1997. Uh, along with my friends, I visited Nakshalwari in 1997, uh, uh, and I met one person, his name was Mr. Krishna Bhakta Sharma, and he had disclosed that how they had uh, visited China with uh, their teams uh, through the roots of Nepal. So uh, the book that you have referred is yes, really a new one, but at that time I was a student, I did not have that much of understanding that what is the important thing that uh, Mr. Sharma is sharing with us along with Kanushanal and others. Now, in the 1970 onwards, uh, we have seen that how mainland China was recognized by USA and it got the permanent place in the UN and also the relationship between uh, India and USA that took a new dimension. So from that time, we have seen a different kind of understanding between India and China. Now, you have discussed in details how uh, in the post-liberalization uh, period, how the Chinese uh, or China became a center of the investment of different countries, including USA, European countries, as well as Japan. But at present, how China is facing this trouble because of the withdrawal or disinvestment in uh, capital of the production of different things. Then one thing that you have uh, discussed how China is really trying to encircle India because of its engagements with the neighbors of India, uh, uh, say uh, from Pakistan. China and uh, Pakistan is trying to build up the highway, super highway uh, for the trade purpose and that would be a very dangerous uh, threat for India too. Now in regards to the Bhutan and Nepal, these are the countries which once uh, the Chinese felt that this is the, their region, nothing but more than that. And Bhutan particularly is a very sensitive issue both for China and uh, India. And uh, you have rightly discussed how uh, the merger of Shikim became an issue for China, became an issue for Bhutan also. Then Bangladesh, in the last year only, I had visited Bangladesh and uh, in a seminar uh, come a workshop, a discussion was going on that how China is trying to create a kind of support base among the intellectuals of Bangladesh or the pro-Chinese sentiment is growing up in China, in spite of good relationship between India, sorry, in Bangladesh, in, in spite of good relationship between India and Bangladesh. Similarly, my Sri Lanka visit in last year, we have found the same thing that how uh, Sri Lanka uh, uh, became a partner of China and trying to play a role against India. So the policy of China and its engagement with the neighbors of India in spite of not having the direct border relationship between China and this country, they are now gradually emerging a serious threat for, uh, for India. Now, the natural issue like the river system, it is a really very uh, sensitive issue for India because there are many rivers which are flowing through China to India to Bangladesh. At the same time, there are many rivers which are flowing through Bhutan, India to Bangladesh. And these rivers and the water sharing issues is not only regional in nature, is also international in nature. And in such a situation, how India would uh, deal with all these problems in regards to China, you have rightly enlightened us. We have our different speakers in the, the technical sessions, they will speak on this. And I have a few students here that they will also speak on this. Now, since uh, in this session, the organizers told me that there is no opportunity of question and answer. So, uh, we'll, uh, hope, we hope that once again, we'll be able to listen from you, not only about China, from others, issues also uh, being a true uh, international theorist, as well as an expert on the international studies, international relations. With these few words, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Dr. Lama, as well as our, our organizers for inviting him. And now I like to conclude that this is the end of this technical session. Thank you. Thank you very much.